Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all once again. As you know, we are continuing our series from the letter to the Romans. And today we are in Romans chapter five, verses 12 through 21. This might be one of the densest doctrinal sections in Romans. But it's important not to separate it from the felt need stuff Paul was just talking about in verses one through 11 regarding how to have joy and hope in trials. We tend to think that there are two kinds of Bible teaching. The practical relevant stuff for normal people and then the deep doctrinal stuff for preachers and elders. This is not how Paul saw it. The practical is connected, Paul says, to the profound. The way to deal with problems in your life, as I often say, is to go deeper in whom you are in Christ. Notice, as we pointed out last week, that the first word in this paragraph in verse 12 is therefore. By using therefore, Paul is showing that what he's about to say connects with what he just got through talking about having to do with joy and suffering. These truths are how all of us can face life, Paul says, with hope and balance and joy, and at the same time, how we can be freed from bitterness and regret. Now look with me at the rest of verse 12, and then verse 14 as Paul sets the stage for this deep doctrinal stuff. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did, who is a pattern of the one to come. Now, if you remember from chapter four, Paul used a story of Abraham to show how Abraham's story in life illustrates the whole concept of justification by faith. Here in chapter four, he goes back even farther, all the way back to Adam, the first man to show how even Adam's story sets up the gospel. He shows that all of history can be understood and therefore told as the story of two Adams. And here's the basic idea. Adam, the first human created, chose to defy God's authority and, re and to reject his clear command to avoid the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because of that choice, he says, that death descended on all people. Even though we weren't present physically with Adam, God regards Adam's choice to be ours. Right. And by the way, this is what's commonly called the doctrine of, orig of original sin, although it is misunderstood and mi misinterpreted by many people. Now, notice how verse 12 ends. This becomes the interpretive key for this section, verses 12 through 21. It simply says, because all sinned. How many sinned? All, all sinned. Right. Now, we say, when we read this or hear it, well, that doesn't seem fair. We weren't consulted. There was no committee. We didn't get a vote. How can we be held responsible for something that we had no part in? And this is where I have struggled too. I mean, think about it. The effect of this choice was not insignificant. Because of this choice, death passed upon all. And that means every disease, every natural disaster, every cancel struggle, or every person who, who struggles with cancer, every child born with a birth defect, every divorce, every rape, every war, every case of abuse, even hell itself goes back to this choice. And I wasn't there for it. So how is that even begin to be fair? Well, 
in calling Adam our representative, God is saying that he knew what Adam would choose and what each of us would choose if we had been given that same choice. Now keep in mind, God was not some passive observer. He is the infinitely wise creator. He understands literally everything about us. And he knew that how, how Adam acted would be how each of us would react in that very same situation. We may want to, but we can't justifiably claim and say, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Had I been there, I would have done something different. I would have done the right thing. Because in saying that, we proclaim that we know better than God. And God, who knows all and is infinitely just, knew that given the same temptation, we would have done the exact same thing Adam did. Now, Pat, ponder that for a second. You can't even keep ice cream in your house without being tempted. And you think that you could have resisted the temptation to eat from the tree where you're promised to be godlike and have godlike power and godlike knowledge? And yet, you still say, but still, I didn't make that choice. That doesn't seem fair to be held accountable for something that I didn't do. That I did not choose. Okay, but haven't you ratified that choice at some point in your life? Think about it. Hasn't there been a time in your life where you adopted Adam's line of thinking? Yes. I know better than God. I would rather do what I want to do rather than what God wants me to do. Amen. Have you ever said that? Amen. How many times in your life have you known the right thing to do and still you didn't do it? In fact, you chose the opposite. And even though you weren't there physically present with Adam when he sinned, we all made the same choice. I think all of these things are applied in that phrase at the end of verse 12, because all sinned. How many sinned? All. all sinned. And this means that we all sin in Adam because God saw Adam as our representative. And that's how he treated him. Result of this choice, Paul says, is that death spread to all people, which of course means spiritual death and physical death. And even if we're still struggling with the logic behind why sin works the way it does, we at least have to concede the presence of its effects. How else could you explain the pervasive wickedness of humankind? Why do we as a race have such trouble doing what's right, even though we know it's wrong and bad for us? Right. Why do riches always seem to lead to selfishness and power to corruption? Why are we attracted to the wrong so much? Because every single person is horribly bent toward evil. Amen. Yet, and this is a lot of bad news, look what he says in verse 13. Paul says that this whole idea of being represented by someone is actually great news also because it sets up the way of our salvation. Because, see, he says, if the whole world were under sin by one man. What if salvation could come to everyone through one man also? Amen. And that's exactly where Paul turns next in verse 14. He says, nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam. Does everybody see what he means by that? He means that Adam is a type of the coming one. And that's in caps. Another Adam, he says, would be born to the human race. And this one would be similar to the first Adam, only in reverse. 
Verses 15 and 17 is where he explains. But the gift is not like the trespass. Everybody see that? The gift is not. For if many died by the trespass of the one man, now everybody look at this, maybe underline it in your Bible. This is, this is powerful. How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of the righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? What are you doing in life as a Christian? He says, you are reigning. That's a prince or a princess under the king. So why do Christians live so impotently? Why are Christians so afraid? As I mentioned to you many times before, faith can be defined as placing your trust in someone else. It is impossible to please God without faith, meaning it's impossible to please God without trusting him with everything that you have and with everything that you can understand. In fact, it's beyond all of those things because we do not live according to sight and we do not follow our own dictates, our own observations, and we don't deify our intelligence. We submit those things to the authority of God as understood through the word of God. Amen. That's why we proclaim constantly. It's the word of God, the will of God, and the power of God. Right. If you know the word of God, you can find the will of God. And if you follow the will of God, you will experience the power of God. Amen. But if you do not do the two previous, you will live impotently and you will be powerless and you will not understand the whole concept of the gospel. Why did Jesus have to become weak to become strong? Why do you have to become a fool to be wise? Because God turns everything on its head. Everything that we observe and think is true about life and about understanding has to be submitted to a greater authority. We have to submit our intelligence to the word of God. If you do, you will experience what he's talking about here, where you reign in life. You see, Adam and Jesus are alike, Paul says. How, you ask? That seems like a really strange thing to say. Adam and Jesus are alike, really? Well, they're alike in that their actions have implications for the whole human race. But they're also different, Paul says. The motivation behind what they did was different. The first Adam selfishly disobeyed God and ate from the forbidden tree. The second Adam sacrificially obeyed God and climbed up on a cursed tree to take that curse into himself. The first Adam brought death upon the whole human race. The second Adam restored life to all who would receive it. Now follow this, this line of thought. And we're gonna start in the Gospel of John. John as I just said, in his gospel, does what Paul does here. He draws a parallel between Jesus and Adam. John starts out his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the word, a clear allusion to Genesis chapter one. In Genesis chapter one, the word of God brought order and beauty to an empty, chaotic world. Throughout Jesus' ministry, John shows us how he, the word of God, brings order and beauty to empty and chaotic lives. John points out that Jesus died on the sixth day. That was the day on which Adam was created. Jesus' death was bringing an end to the first creation. John shows us furthermore that Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week, showing that he was the beginning of a new creation. John highlights that Jesus died with a crown of thorns on his head, which was 
one of the curses for man's sin. He was literally taking it on his head. John tells us that the first person Jesus encounters after his resurrection is Mary in a garden who doesn't recognize Jesus. She thinks he's a gardener. This is symbolic because the last place that man and God had been together was in a garden where Adam and Eve hid from God. Jesus appeared to Mary in the garden where Jesus is saying, I came back for you and met you in the same place you left me. When Jesus meets his disciples after the resurrection, John tells us that he breathes on them his Holy Spirit. Odd, maybe. But he is recreating the first creation. His point? It's the same as Paul's here. Jesus is the second Adam, restoring all that the first Adam messed up in the world. We were condemned through the actions of a representative who did what any of us in his situation would have done. But now we are saved through a representative who did what none of us could have done. And by the way, this idea of a representative acting on the behalf of his people is alluded to all throughout the Old Testament. In the sacrificial system, it was a representative lamb who died on behalf of the people. In the story of David and Goliath, David beats Goliath all by himself as Israel's representative as they all stood on the sidelines just watching. See, all these point to the ultimate representative who would win the ultimate battle for us. And that's then what Paul talks about in verse 18. Look at what he says. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation of all people, so also justification, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. In other words, just like death came through a representative, life comes to all people through a representative. Now, you see that phrase, life for all people? Does that mean that everyone is going to be saved? Well, just like through Adam's sin, we were all made automatically sinners. Maybe through Christ's sacrifice, we were all made righteous, someone may say. But that would contradict too many things that Paul has said, even right here in Romans. Not everyone is saved. Everybody listen. Faith has to lay hold of righteousness. Do you hear me? Faith has to lay hold of righteousness. Meaning that you must comprehend the gospel, believe it, obey it, and live according to it. Paul even indicates in this passage that not everyone will be saved. See, Paul is saying that there are two family lines, one from Adam and one from Jesus, and you have to choose. Team Adam or team Jesus. You either choose the one or you choose the other. Now, not... Incidentally or coincidentally, the word one shows up 12 times in these verses. However, what you need to know is that the word one, O-N-E, in this context means unity with. So if you're one with Christ, you are in unity with Christ. We are either one with Adam in his sin and condemnation, or one with Jesus in his submission to the Father and eternal life. And this whole chapter really can be summed up in one question and one answer. With whom are you? You say, well, I don't like it that I'm included in Adam's choice. Okay, but now you have the chance to reverse it. Does everybody see that? And this is what is his point beginning in verses 20 and 21. 
He says, but where sin increased, grace increased how much? All the more. Were they equal? So let's say sin increased up to here, right here. So did grace meet it or did it surpass it? It surpassed it. What does that tell you about God? You've got a problem in your life and you don't know how to solve it. And you say to yourself, I can't do this. It's silly for me to think that I can. And the reason you think that is because God's power is always greater than your problem. Amen. And there is no comparison. Reality is actually asymmetrical. God is bigger. You can't even begin to measure the difference. And yet, in the futility of our thinking, when we face problems, we either treat them alike or we treat the spiritual as if it weren't even there. In that sense, religion becomes a coping mechanism. You live naturally and you use religion or God to make you feel better while you go through it naturally. But that's not what he says. That is no faith. There is no faith in that. What Paul means here is that no matter how dark or bad the sin, God's grace is always greater. Amen. Verse 21, so that just as sin reigned in death, everybody look, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And here's what that means. God has already provided everything necessary for salvation for the whole human race. There is only one race of people, church. The sons and daughters of Adam. And we all have the same problem, sin. God sent a second Adam to redeem. And Paul says that he is sufficient to save all the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. He died for all of them. He took all their thorns. And according to Paul and John, he waits for them in the garden. He wants to breathe into their nostrils the breath of life. So I have two questions that Paul basically asks us in this chapter. Have you chosen the second Adam? Remember, you didn't choose to be born to the first Adam. But you get to choose who you want to be born the second time around. That's why it's called to be born again. Have you been born again? And the question is, with whom do you want to be one? Who do you want unity with? So that's the question that I leave with you today. It's an easy one. Do you want Adam or do you want the Son of God? It's either one or the other. As for me and my household, we'll choose the Lord. So if you've not lived your life the way you hoped and you've struggled with all this stuff and you haven't been reigning in your life powerfully, that's understandable. We all struggle. There's always a better choice. And the choice is always the unseen. The choice is always to be obedient to the Almighty. And so we say as I close, to the only eternal, immortal, and invisible God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. If we can help you in any way, please find your way up front to meet with one of our shepherds, or if you'd like to meet in the back to talk with one of those, do that as well. Or if you'd like to come to Jesus today to be born again, we provide that moment right now as we all stand and sing.